Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending upon where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special lecture series on international business and regional studies. My name is Yong Sun Pat. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, our gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for the past four years, and also sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education, as well as Department of Communication Studies. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures, and movie screenings. LMU is also among the 15 schools in the country who received one of the most prestigious cyber grants award from the US Department of Education. The LMU Center for International Business Education serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners through international business and area study education, foreign language training, and research capacities. Before we start the program tonight, I'd like to ask Dr. Dale Smith, the Dean of College of Business Administration, say a few words to welcome everyone. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Professor Peck. And it's my pleasure on behalf of the College of Business at LMU to welcome all of you and our panelists for tonight's webinar, Planning Ahead for LA 28. My enthusiasm for anything related to global communities coming together and celebrating individuals who are passionate about a life goal couldn't be stronger. It was Muhammad Ali who once said, champions aren't made in the gym. Champions are made from something they have deep inside them, a desire, a dream, a vision. How relevant these remarks are now as they were then. The entire movement of the Olympiad is about athletes reaching deep inside for their Olympic dream. And for those who plan the Olympic games to connect athletes and fans, countries and cultures, the vision couldn't be more important and their responsibility for helping thousands of athletes realize their dreams is paramount. You know, it's interesting, my heart sings in every Olympic game as I look at the Olympic flag and think about what it represents, the interconnectivity of nations represented by those six interlocking rings of colors, colors that symbolize the flags of over 200 nations and the athletes that put sport and passion above politics. And while the Olympiad hasn't been free from conflict and controversy, the spirit of the games and the coming together of culture, language, pursuit of success and pride in a performance remains for me the hope of many to showcase the best of what we can accomplish as a global community. And I am so proud that I will be living in LA when the games come here. As I reflect on our goal as educators in a business school, I recognize how important it is to have a deep level understanding about history, politics, communication and economics, impact relationships between nations. And that certainly applies to any discussion on the Olympics and the lessons learned from previous games. We're called upon to understand the larger global picture and dig deep to understand what's needed to make the business of Olympics free from that controversy and politicizing what has often gotten in the way of enjoying the passion for sport and the deeper level goals of a modern Olympic Games. So as we come together across disciplines, boundaries, and ultimately borders, making the planet a better ecosystem for all of us, let's remember that in the spirit of sport, that brings us together every two years in celebration of the Olympics. Um, the words of uh, Bear Bryant who shared, it's not the will to win, but the will to prepare that makes the difference. And long before that proverbial ball is snapped, pitched or tipped, there's work to be done. And tonight's talk is really about that preparation, showcasing Los Angeles and our region as a place where the world comes together to deliver on desires, dreams, and vision. I hope you enjoy the talk tonight. Back to you, Professor Peck. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for your nice summary of Olympic spirit and its implications for Global Village and also Global Business uh, and your welcome remarks. So today we have a great program for you. We have invited Mrs. Ashley Dos Santos, Senior Director of Communications at LA28 to learn about 2028 Summer Games. 
Tokyo 2020 Games, which was greatly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, just ended about a, month, a week ago. It is our own very own city, Los Angeles, that will host the Summer Olympic and Para, uh, Paralympic Games in 2028. This will be the third time we will host Olympic Games, but it will be the very first time to host both Olympic and Paralympic Games. Many stakeholders and business partners will be involved to make this event a great success, not only for the city of LA, but also for our nation. This webinar will cover some of the key issues involving the 2028 games, such as financial viability, CSR, DEI, to just name a few. Today's conversation with Mrs. Dos Santos will be moderated by two LMU professors of communication studies. So let me introduce them. First, Dr. Chris Finley is an associate professor who has published numerous popular press pieces and offered expert analysis and commentary for major global and national media entities. He has also consulted for clients in speech writing, policy analysis, and strategic communication. Dr. Finley's interests include digital social media, international relations, public diplomacy and strategic communication, sports communication, political communication, and journalism. The other moderator, Dr. Sean Anderson, he's also an associate professor of organizational communication, and he's also the faculty advisor for Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability at Loyola Marymount University. He's also the CEO of CSR Global Consulting Company, which provides strategy regarding ethical decision-making. He's the author of forthcoming book, Shut Up and Dribble, the Black Athlete Revolt in the Age of Black Lives Matter. Audience, if you'd like to submit questions during the webinar, please click on the questions button at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a brief survey. Now, I'd like to ask Dr. Finley to introduce our speaker. Dr. Finley. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a, a wonderful introduction. I, I think I can speak on behalf of all of us here at LMU um, that we are thrilled to have Ashley join us today. Um, Ashley is a senior director of communications uh, for the LA 28 Olympic and Paralympic Games. You're um, a Los Angeles native um, who headed east to double major in women and gender studies and Roman, uh, romance language at, at Dartmouth. And then you began your communications career in Washington DC working for Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Your background spans consumer marketing, corporate crisis communication, and government relations. And prior to joining LA28, uh, Ashley spent nearly five years at Ticketmaster and Live Nation Entertainment, and also served as Vice President of Consumer and Corporate PR at both Edelman and Ogilvy, um, where Ashley worked on a variety of sports, entertainment, CSR, and multicultural initiatives. Ashley, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. It's great to be here. Um, so what, what I didn't mention in the bio, but I want to start off with, which is you have some personal connections to LMU. Uh, so I figured we should start there. I do. I'd like to shout out to my parents, Vicky and Moses Valenzuela. Um, they were in the classes in the 70s. I won't give their exact year and age them too much. Uh, but they met at LMU, fell in love, my mom's freshman year, and uh, here we are several decades later. Well, that's wonderful. So in a way, we're welcoming you back to LMU. Right? So, so, so you know, again, thank you so much for being here. Let's let's start with sort of a big picture. Um, I think we have a general sense um, of what LA28 is, but the organization itself, can you tell us a little bit about um, what its, its purview is and perhaps speak to your role as Senior Director of Communications? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, LA28 is the organizing committee for the Olympic and Paralympic Games when they come to LA in seven short years. Um, as Dr. Pack mentioned, this will be the third time that Los Angeles is hosting the Olympic Games and the first time that we're excited to host the Paralympic Games, which really provides a world of limitless possibility for the Paralympic movement and for Los Angeles as a whole. And really our charge as an organizing committee is to ensure that we create an amazing games experience for everyone for athletes and fans and our community as a whole, which is very much grounded in Los Angeles. And that's near and dear to my heart personally, being a native Angelina. Um, but, you know, as you all know, and Dr. Smith mentioned early on, the Olympic and Paralympic Games are 
the world's biggest and greatest, most tremendous platform for peacefully and positively connecting with people around the world. It's a platform for human achievement, for diversity and inclusion, um, it's a celebration of sport and competition and fandom. And we're just so excited to have the games returning to LA. So, you know, LA 28 in a nutshell is the privately funded uh, nonprofit independent organization. We're governed by a volunteer board of directors with financial support from our corporate partners. Uh, LA is in a very unique position in that we were awarded the games 11 years ahead of time. Most o OCOGs or organizing committees uh, bid for the games and have a seven year runway to put the entire games together. But LA 28 was actually vying for the um, summer games in 2024 back in 2017 uh, in competition with Paris and the IOC, the International Olympic Committee and the IPC, the International Paralympic Committee, will be lots of acronyms in this talk, so I apologize in advance. Um, they decided that they wanted to award us at the same time. Um, both cities and regions had a ton to offer for the summer games. So they let Paris have the games first um, in 2024. And then LA will be hosting, like I said, in 2028. So that's really how we came to be. And we use those extra, you know, unanticipated first three years to really focus on the commercial aspect of our planning and really shore up um, our revenue planning and funding with private partners to help fund our games and bring them to life so that now that we've gotten to the traditional more seven year trajectory for planning, we can really focus on the traditional technical aspects of games planning as a whole. So um, we're fortunate with LA, we have sort of an embarrassment of riches when it comes to venues that we have so many tremendous existing world-class venues throughout the city, frankly, more than we're gonna be able to use for all of the events that we will be putting on. Um, our Athletes Village will be housed at UCLA, and uh, we will be hosting events at universities, at stadiums, at arenas, and at venues all throughout the city and Southern California as a whole. So that has really given us the flexibility um, financially and otherwise from the benefit of time to not have to spend literally the billions of dollars that many other organizing committees have to spend on building infrastructure. Um, to really say, okay, what are we going to do to shore up our human legacy and make sure that we are leaving the Los Angeles community better than we found it? So really today, we're beginning our journey with those games and with that planning and exploring the possibility that lies ahead. So we're incredibly optimistic for the future. Um, and our entire organization is really committed to our mission of creating an unparalleled games experience for, for our community and for all of our partners. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, so I, I think we'll probably start um, by talking a little bit about Tokyo. Um, Sean, I'm going to throw the ball over to you for a minute. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Finley. And Ashley, thanks again for being here. And, and so, we, you know, we think about our, our lives and what we've heard uh, growing up saying that um, you know, the, the best way to move forward and to pre prepare for things in the future is to learn from our past, right? And so, as Dr. Brock talked about, uh, we, we just had the Tokyo Olympics, uh, the Tokyo 2020 and 2021, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, um, and we all know that that came about because of this global pandemic that pretty much we're still recovering from. And so, with what you just talked about, and uh, what you are preparing for in the future, what lessons uh, do you believe that you learned uh, from the Tokyo Olympics? How did they handle it? Uh, what can you foresee going forward with how you would move forward with uh, uh, just preparing for, for, for such a global pandemic, right? You know, how can you prepare for something like that in the future? Uh, what do you think about how these games were handled, and how do you move forward in such a way? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, first, I really want to give credit where credit is due to the organizing committee for Tokyo, the TOCOG, as we call them. You know, they did such a tremendous job in handling 
you can say it's the unexpected, but I think that that's the understatement of the century. No one saw a global pandemic coming and they were able to pivot and you know, work overtime, again, understatement of the century to keep everyone safe and to plan an engaging and incredible games experience. And from everyone that I've spoken to, um, you know, from everyday viewers like myself who didn't make it to Tokyo to those who were actually on the ground, they did really a tremendous job. So they should be credited for that in a huge way. Really what that taught us is that we can plan for every contingency that is known and we also have to plan for the unknown because we may have a thousand things on our list of things that we anticipate could happen for the games, but there will always be that, you know, 1001 item that comes up that we just can't plan for. So what we can plan for is to bring together a group of super talented individuals in our organization who can help us with that planning and who can, you know, pivot on a dime and be prepared to help for things that we can't possibly prepare for. Because I, I certainly hope by 2028, COVID is a distant, terrible memory for all of us, but you know, there will be something else. That's just how life works. My grandma me always says, you know, whenever you get through something, you just have to say, okay, what's next? Because you know, there's something else right around the corner. So for us, that is what we are working hard now to plan for, you know, we're, we're shoring up our insurance, we're, looking at climate change and everything that is happening, you know, from an environmental perspective to figure out not just how we can have the smallest footprint, but to offset some of the things that we know are happening. Global warming is real. Cities are getting hotter. We're hosting a summer games. Those are things that we're actively planning for. And, you know, the, the organizers, our colleagues over in Tokyo have been tremendous partners in sharing their key learnings. We're already in regular weekly, sometimes daily talks with the great folks over in Paris about their games planning so that we're able to learn from them, winter games in between. So we really are really keeping our ear to the ground to understand you know, how some of those dynamics are gonna be changing and what we should anticipate. From a games consumption standpoint, I think we were all really excited to see how fans are choosing to engage with the games in general. Um, you know, There are all these stories about broadcast numbers going down around the games. And while that's true, that's also true of everything. Broadcast numbers were slipping for the Super Bowl last year, slipping for Grammys and things like that. Not because interest is lower, but because fans are choosing to consume content, consume this form of entertainment on streaming services, on their mobile devices when they're on the Metro, you know, looking at snackable size content on TikTok and Instagram and other platforms. So, you know, we saw huge numbers and huge spikes for Peacock, for the partnership with Roku, for, you know, a lot of the digital content that they were putting out. We saw that even on our own channels with a lot of the content we were putting out across LA28 and Team USA. So understanding that that's only gonna grow as time goes on, that TikTok now is the, you know, social media platform of choice, but there are going to be two or three new TikToks at least by the time 2028 rolls around. So, you know, I still remember Vine and some of the others that were hot in the moment and are gone now. Um, for those who had a MySpace page, like you understand. So it's just a matter of staying on top of those trends and looking to see, you know, where the trends are taking us so that we can be ahead of the curve as much as possible. Absolutely, and, and it was a great answer. And, and, and so I take some of the things that you you just mentioned, right? That, that LA is this this global city, right? Where where so many people from so many different backgrounds come and learn, live, work, play, right? Uh, but we also see LA um, outside of its very global reputation as very much this sort of uh, building block for businesses and community. Right, uh, uh, so many uh, local ma and pa restaurants, uh, small businesses uh, that thrive throughout this this city, and so the third time's a charm, if you will, when you think about uh, <laughs> LA hosting uh, the Olympic Games. But but why now, or I should say, why 2028? What makes LA so unique at this time now, as you prepare? And then for when the games occur, and then the possibilities of how 
the Olympics will move forward in the future? That's a great question. Um, and it's hard for me to answer that concisely because I am the city of Los Angeles's biggest fan, um, just you know, being here born and raised and my family and everything else. So there's so much that LA has to offer um, that you know, while we want to tap into what really makes LA tick, all the you know, hundreds of dialects and communities that exist throughout our city that you can drive 10 minutes in any direction and be in an entirely different community, just the beauty that LA has to bring. We want to work with all, all groups, all communities, all stakeholders throughout Los Angeles, big and small, to really ensure that we are co-creating the games and that we are showcasing everything that LA has to bring to life. Um, but you know, at its most basic level, with the Olympic and Paralympic Games being this huge global sporting event, LA, you know, as I'm quoting Derek Fisher now in an event that I saw him in a few months ago, LA is the sports capital of the world. We have two football teams, uh, American football and soccer. We have, you know, our baseball teams. We have hockey. We have everything. Um, we have new leagues popping up. You know, it feels like every day. And we have all of this amazing state-of-the-art infrastructure to house those teams. And we have fans, you know, if you even saw the, the Rams home opener on Sunday, these just rabid fans tailgating whether or not they had a ticket to get inside SoFi Stadium. They were so excited that live sports and live events in general were back. And that is the heart and the beauty of the LA community. And that's really what we want to showcase when we bring the games back to LA. In addition to the fact that we know we can do it sustainably. You know, we do have our radical reuse strategy that we say the, the most sustainable venue is the one that you don't have to build. And we have so many already that we'll be utilizing. You know, we want to really empower youth through the power of sport. We've um, already started working with the city of LA to fund a lot of the youth sport programming throughout the city. And of course, COVID put, you know, threw a monkey wrench into some of those programs, but we even announced earlier this summer that we are investing, you know, 9.6 million over just the next school year between now and May 22 in youth sport programming, introducing kids in, you know, low income communities to judo and karate and teak ball, which I didn't even know what that was until um, recently, and other sports swimming that they wouldn't necessarily have exposure to. And that's part of our $160 million commitment to the city between now and 2028. So there's so much that we want to give to the city of Los Angeles because Los Angeles gives us so much in being able to, to host the games. And so thank you for that again. And, and I know, as you mentioned, it, it's hard to kind of explain uh, what the future holds because, you know, of course, we're, we're not there. But I want to take it back to 1984 to when, it, when many people said that the that Olympics sort of set the standard for what we see today. And Dr. Finley uh, has a question relative to that. So I'm going to kick it back to him. Thank you, Sean. So, so actually, I, I think you, you, you absolutely hit the, the nail on the head that LA has, you know, is one of the sports capitals of the world, if not the sports capital of the world. I think, though, though it's fair to say that, that LA has a special relationship with the Olympics, right? Um, this is the third time, as Sean said, this is the third time the charm. Um, but what we've seen is not just LA hosting the Olympics, but radically um, uh, sort of pushing the IOC to, to reimagine itself in terms of engaging fans, engaging uh, communities. And so I was wondering if, if you are, are you and the organization are hoping to sort of build on some of the transformative um, effects of 84 under Peter Uberoth and, you know, the sort of reimagining the financial side of things and sponsorship and business that came out this time in terms of engaging communities and engaging fans. Um, if you could speak to that a little bit. Absolutely. You know, we, we touched on earlier all the things that we learned from the Tokyo Games, and there was a tremendous amount of learnings that we're still sifting through. They released about over 100 case studies just this morning. That's going to take um, a little bit more than the few hours I've had to, to comb through and read through them, with more coming throughout the rest of the month. But LA 84, you're right, absolutely did set the stage for the, you know, Olympic Games and soon to be Paralympic Games coming back to Los Angeles, and that it was the first games ever held that not only um, met their budget goals, but they actually had a budget surplus, and that money, the hundreds of millions of dollars that they had left over from private funding um, is still 
powering the LA 84 Foundation today that continues to give back to the city of LA, you know, 37 years later. So that's really a tremendous case study for us to see, you know, all of that, all of the good that the games can bring to a host city when you are blessed with things like existing infrastructure and other items that really allow you to focus on creating that game's experience versus sort of the nitty gritty technical aspects of the games that are already built for us. Um, you know, speaking with Dr. Smith earlier, she had mentioned um, that there was sort of this Carmageddon uh, idea of running through Los Angeles in 84 that because LA is known to be a traffic -y city with the games coming, it was just gonna be, you know, traffic jams all over the place. And, you know, there was barely a car in sight. It was incredibly successful because it was managed so well from a, you know, Metro and transit transportation sector. Um, the team really did a fantastic job in moving people around safely and efficiently so that transportation was not an issue whatsoever for the games. We're hoping to replicate that, build upon that. We're again, very fortunate that the city already had plans in place to greatly expand the Metro that's gonna be completed, you know, well before the 28 games occur. So there is so much that's already being done in this within the city and within the county and we're working closely with our partners there in addition to again having the earlier runway that we had and winning the games 11 years early instead of seven we've already onboarded three of our founding partners um delta comcast and salesforce in that order who are our top partners and are really helping us reimagine what the games could be and bring them to life not just from a financial standpoint but they are truly partners in every sense of the term. They are committed to diversity and inclusion and really showing up for fans and showing up for the athletes that they support. You know, Toyota, who is another partner of ours through Team USA, they put together the first ever Paralympic Athlete Fund, um, Paralympian Fund, earlier this year to fund every Team USA Paralympian for Tokyo and for the Beijing Winter Games. Um, just as, as part of the, the fund and sponsorship opportunity. And that has never been done before by a partner. So we're really able to work with our commercial partners, work with our you know, games delivery partners who are venues, city of LA, um, nonprofits and other organizations throughout the city to bring our games to life. And LA 84 served as that tremendous model for us to build off of. Wonderful. Um, I, I, I know that, that one of the terms that you've used a few times is this notion of Olympics, Olympics legacy. Um, I was wondering if, if you could sort of speak to that, both in terms of the larger IOC's commitment to legacy, but also um, in terms of how um, uh, some of the, 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 the corporate sponsors and government sponsors, um, how you talk to them about how important legacy is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we want to create a games that everyone is excited about, that, you know, is the type of games that everyone wants to see. And as far as, you know, legacy leaves, we're really, we are a people centric games and our opportunity really lies in leaving that human legacy in, you know, having a chance to reimagine what the games can be and inspire and engage the next generation of Olympic and Paralympic fans with the games. You know, while we have fantastic partners in NBC and Toyota who are really doubling down on their commitment to uh, bringing, giving more life to the Paralympic games and, you know, NBC increased their airtime for the Paralympic games this summer by over a thousand percent from the Rio games. There's still a long way to go, um, unfortunately, but LA 28 is really looking, we're looking at ourselves to be that beacon of hope um, and that, that opportunity to really showcase all of the magic and wonder that comes from the Paralympic Games, highlight the Paralympian stories as you know, elite athletes of bringing their whole selves to the individual sports that they're representing. So from you know, highlighting our Paralympians to sustainability, to our youth sport commitment that I mentioned that you know, is, is able to come to life because of our partnership with IOC. They, they funded that 160 million that we're able to give to the city for youth sports. That is really how we're working with our partners to help bring this all to life. And we are a separate entity. Like I mentioned in the beginning, we are a privately funded nonprofit 
that operates, you know, separately from the IOC and IPC, but we very much work together to help lean into the legacy that we all want to leave behind. Thank you. Um, uh, sort of on that point, you sort of raised something I'm curious about. You, you'd mentioned the potential sort of partners with NBC and how you guys are, are working together to develop notions of legacy. Do you, um, does LA28 explore um, relations with other broadcast partners beyond the American rights holding broadcast? Like, would you work with, say, the BBC or what have you? Or is it, are you mostly focusing locally in the United States in terms of building out that legacy piece with, with your broadcast partners? So for now, because of our official partnership with NBC, we're primarily focused on working with them from a storytelling perspective. We'll work with anyone and everyone who wants to highlight the amazing stories of our athletes or some of the work that our organization is doing. Um, even just this morning, we announced uh, our new CEO, Kathy Carter, who is one of the very few, unfortunately, um, very few women to ever lead an Olympic and Paralympic Games. And she was on Cheddar, for example, earlier today um, and other outlets. So we'll work with anyone who really wants to highlight the storytelling perspective, but from an official games planning perspective, NBC is our partner. Thank you. Sean, I'm gonna, gonna throw it back to you. No problem. So Ashley, again, great, great answers uh, here. I think uh, people are getting a lot of great information. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I wanna take this kind of culminating approach uh, to this question. And I, I take it to the concepts of, of corporate social responsibility. So, you know, in your role and the committee's role to both be successful, but be a socially good, you know, entity, right? And we think about issues such as environmental justice, um, DEI, um, e equality, right, uh, things that many athletes and others uh, in the corporate world fight for today. And so seeing, again, LA as this, this, this global space, this, this place that is recognized, you know, worldwide, um, how and in what ways are you building these uh, DEI platforms, the, the ways in which you can get both the community, the athletes, and just members of society at large uh, together uh, to be that socially good organization that benefits the world. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question um, because you're right, a lot of corporations or other organizations sort of have DEI, CSR um, as part of their HR team solely, or it's you know, not necessarily an afterthought, but it isn't central to their core business planning and strategic planning um, annually or otherwise. And I've, I've worked for other organizations and with where I have, you know, bared witness to that. And one of the beautiful things about LA28 is that we are truly a people first organization and our diversity and inclusion and you know, social responsibility and every component that we are truly committed to is deeply embedded into our business and strategic approach to planning the games as a whole. So it's not something that is tacked on at the end or it's a separate department that, you know, we hope to align with when it makes sense. It is uh, deeply rooted in our hiring practices. It is rooted in the, the vendors that we hire or work with. You know, we ensure that the partners that we bring on board are just as committed to that as we are. Um, so that is a huge part of our, our planning as of right now, because at the end of the day, for us, the, the games and even the movement as a whole um, isn't about coming together under one ideal. It's, it's a time to celebrate the collection of our differences and strive to be a more inclusive world as a whole. And you know the LA 28 games have a huge opportunity to, to really showcase that, to show how we believe in creating what's next and creating a brighter tomorrow. Um, you know, we celebrate individuality and self-expression that was evidenced even in our emblem rollout that we did for our official brand launch, which was in September, 2020. Um, you know, worked with 26 different creators throughout Los Angeles um, from community organizers, to athletes, to big name celebrities from Los Angeles who just believe in the possibility of what the games represent and can bring to Los Angeles. 
we all have unique stories and identities and cultures and defy is singular identity. You know, to go back to the earlier question on why, why LA, why now? It's because LA is so diverse and it's because of everything that we represent to the world. And we really want to lean into that and really showcase the collection of voices that represents Los Angeles and sport and limitless possibility in every aspect of our planning. Thank you. And, and just one quick uh, question to kind of follow up that as well. Um, and we talk about, again, uh, the importance of fan engagement, right? The, the, the communities, the, the uh, everyone else who's involved in the making of these games. Uh, but what the world sees on the center stage, right? are these athletes that have trained for years uh, to compete at the highest level. Um, how are you and your team um, working with athletes uh, to make these games uh, something that's really special for them? Yeah, you're right. I mean, the athletes are the heart of the games. There are no games without the athletes. So we are really working hard to ensure that their voices are reflected throughout every aspect of planning. Um, and earlier this summer, we actually announced our LA 28 Athletes Commission, which is a group of 18 elite athletes, um, nine Olympians, nine Paralympians, who all have SoCal roots. And, um, you know, some are based here now, some are from here, um, that would, some are, you know, still competing, some are retired. And we are kicking off the commission later this month with our first meeting. And we'll be working with these athletes um, and probably growing the commission in the coming years between now and 28 to really ensure that their voices are heard in every aspect of our games planning that they are embedded into every team in LA 28 and that they have, you know, a, a direct insight into everything that it is that we're putting together and are able to share with us their experience in being elite athletes to ensure that we are able to meet and hopefully exceed all of their needs. Um, the Athletes Commission is being led by Janet Evans, who is um, a multiple time, I don't wanna cite it incorrectly, I think four time, a uh, gold medalist. Um, so she, and she actually, Dr. Smith had mentioned Muhammad Ali earlier. Janet Evans actually passed the torch to Muhammad Ali at the 96 games in Atlanta. So she has a long history of being involved with other organizing committees. Um, she herself obviously has competed in several Summer Olympic games. So she is really leading the charge for that in launching the Athletes Commission. And also we have a pilot program um, of athlete fellows uh, who are Olympians who have, who are looking to have more of that behind the scenes business experience and planning a games as opposed to solely competing at the games. And so we actually had our fellows start this summer. It's a year long fellowship for this pilot program to six month rotations. We have one in the communications team right now, Karsta Lowe, who competed in the Rio games as an indoor volleyball player. Um, so we are really ensuring that we are trying to provide every opportunity we can for athletes before, during, and after the games to help them with their professional development, to make sure that ahead of the games, they have access to everything they need from a training um, and preparation perspective, not just physically, but mentally as well. Because as we saw throughout Tokyo, you know, mental health really became a huge topic for athletes who are competing and something that, you know, probably hasn't had the attention that it really deserves. So that's something that is front and center for our planning efforts uh, between now and 28. Right, and thank you again. Uh, such, again, such wonderful answers. I'm really loving this. And, and I really like, again, uh, the, the targeted focus on also uh, bringing about the importance of the Paralympic Games. Mm. And I want to pitch it back to Dr. Finley because I know he has uh, some great questions regarding that. Thank you. I actually, actually, I wanted to, to just comment because it, it really is quite innovative what, what um, LA28 is doing with the athletes. Um, so, so before I, I pivot, because I do want to talk about Paralympics for a minute, I want to just, just ask, um, does that mean in that, that new um, initiative that you guys are working in tandem with the IFs or is this outside of um, the, the IFs in terms of direct outreach to the athletes? Do you mean for the commission or yeah. for the fellowship program? Well, yes, yeah, so both. 
So we definitely work with the IFs from an input perspective just to get their POV on what has and hasn't worked in the past. Um, we work very, very closely with the USOPC, the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, uh, which basically essentially manages Team USA because they have their own um, athletes council as well. Uh, IOC and IPC do too. So we've of course worked with others, other organizing committees to see, you know, to get best practices and key learnings in the development of our commission. Um, and we are also just incredibly blessed to have Janet Evans as our chief athlete officer, whose connections are astounding. Um, she can, you know, just pick up the phone and text Apollo Ono or, you know, Muhammad Ali's family or really anyone in a matter of seconds and get them on the phone. So between her contacts and connections and her, you know, Southern California base and her roots here, she's she's native to SoCal as well. Um, and all of the other organizations, we were able to pull together the commission and uh, also receive nominations for athlete fellows as well to apply to that program. That's great, thank you. Um, so in terms of, of, of the athlete, athlete focus, I think we'd be remiss not to talk about the important role of the Paralympics um, in uh, the greater uh, vision of LA28. Can you speak directly to our Paralympians and also the larger Paralympic plans? Yeah, so much is still in the works. Um, there's so much possibility for what we can do when it comes to the, the Paralympic Games, but you know, we, we think about and we focus on the Paralympic Games in every single aspect of our planning. And you know, while other organizations, other organizing committees have done a tremendous job with the games, um, oftentimes, at least in the past, it has been very distinct between you know, Olympic Games planning and Paralympic Games planning. But even as evidenced in our athletes commission with being made up of nine Olympians and nine Paralympians, everyone has a seat at the table at the same time talking about the issues that are universal to athletes. So it's very important to us that, you know, it, it, we aren't necessarily viewing these as very two distinct platforms and two distinct games. We are incorporating everyone's voice into the planning to ensure they all have a seat at the table. Um, working with some of our A creators who are Paralympians as well, as Refrak, who actually just um, competed in Tokyo as well. He hopes to go all the way to 2028, and we hope he does, this, I hope he does too. He's in high school now, so it's pretty likely. Um, you know, he created one of the, the A's uh, for our LA28 emblem. He, while he isn't officially on our LA28 Athletes Commission, um, works with our team day in, day out when we have questions, you know, participates in interviews about the games um, on our behalf. So we have a lot of great partnerships and we hope to continue to build those and shore those up in the coming years as we get closer to our games. Awesome, thank you. Um, boy, the time is flying. <laughs> so, so, so thank you so much for this. I feel like we, we could talk about a number of these issues for hours at a time. Um, what I do wanna do is, is just sort of bring in some of the, the Q and A's from the audience members. Um, a number of, of folks have asked questions, I think, speak to, to um, the sort of structure of how games are actually delivered. Um, one question says, um, you know, it, it, you mentioned a few times that it's going to be completely privately funded, but if there are cost overruns, certainly we saw that with, with Tokyo. Um, the one person's asked, who's ultimately on the hook for it? And I think that as that really speaks to that question of how um, the, the IOC contract with LA28 is, is actually written, um, because I think there's sometimes confusion about that. Do you want to speak to that sort of structure of who LA28 reports to and that relationship? Yeah, so we really report to the board, um, which I mentioned is a, a volunteer uh, group for our board of directors. That's ultimately who we report to. And uh, LA28's budget is 6.9 billion to put on the games, um, of which the IOC gives us a portion of that. Our corporate partners make up the bulk and then um, private donors and other funding sources from licensees, tickets, you know, merchandise, things like that help make up the rest. But as I mentioned, the really the, the majority is with our corporate partners. Um, we have a unique partnership with NBC that we forged in in 2018, well, where they are helping us to bring on some of our, our larger corporate partners. 
they were very instrumental in our agreements with Delta and Comcast and Salesforce as our top three, uh, or our first three, I should say, um, founding partnerships and are working with us to bring on others within that group as well. Um, they have committed to underwrite a portion of that if we should, for some reason, not meet our budget goals, but we are very much on track and, you know, our, because of our earlier runway and our earlier start, we are in really great shape to ensure that we do meet our, our budget expectations. Thank you. On that point, another question that, that's come up um, is, is about the, the, the private partners. And uh, the person asked if the funders are the typical Olympic sponsors. And obviously, I think that speaks to the unique organizational structure um, that actually came out of LA originally of the top sponsorship program versus um, the, the game-specific national partners. Can you speak to how those two different forms of sponsorship work? Yeah, so again, speaking to our unique partnerships, also in 2018, we formed a partnership with USOPC, um, again, the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee for Team USA, um, to create the USOPP, which we don't refer to publicly as often, but it's basically the US Olympic and Paralympic properties where LA28 actually owns the marketing rights for Team USA and LA28, so that when we are going to partners to you know, potentially come on board with the games, they are purchasing the right to market for both Team USA and LA28, which just provides tremendous value for partners and being able to work with both properties. So that is a really huge selling point and very appealing for a lot of the partners who were already on board previously and who are coming on board now um, for that sort of joint package. So that is, is part of that approach there as well. So you do, you do see some of the, the usual suspects who have been around for quite some time. Um, Toyota, for example, is a, a longstanding partner of the games uh, and others, but um, then we have some of the newer, more unique partnerships like Salesforce, uh, who just came on board more recently. Thank you. Sean, I'm gonna throw it back to you. All right, thanks. And so, um, actually, I want to kind of go into uh, some of the questions that look into uh, sort of the, the fan experience, sort of fan engagement, right? Uh, because um, Los Angeles has so many venues and, and so many places for people uh, to go as the games uh, commence. And so uh, one of the questions that I see here is, uh, what is new for the fan experience uh, for the Tokyo games and how, <clears throat> excuse me, will you incorporate uh, like the entertainment centers, for example, of LA into the games going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it to Tokyo just because of, you know, COVID restrictions and wanting to keep our footprint small there. But I know that they leaned very heavily into technology, really to help keep everyone safe um, and monitoring where everyone was was going for um, you know tracking and safety purposes with COVID, of course, and just to help with traffic flow overall. I think there is so much technology that is in the works to help support and amplify fan engagement that we're really excited to leverage moving forward. You know, we talked about some of the sort of table stakes social media platforms that are out there now, where fans are consuming content. You know sometimes every second of every day. So that's really huge. And we are working to build our audiences across social. Um, we are very much looking at how audiences are consuming other forms of content um, and looking at exploring and expanding upon those digital platforms and really just keeping our ear to the ground on what's next to make sure that we are at the forefront of new technology, working with partners like Salesforce and Deloitte and others who are really helping us from a strategic standpoint when it comes to new technology for fan engagement is, is really gonna be instrumental in our games delivery as well. So lots to come, we're still early stages, but um, we're definitely gonna be exploring every possible avenue, especially when it comes to new technology. Right, and, and just to kind of follow up on that again, as you say, you know, we can't really predict a lot Right, because again, we, we don't know what's gonna happen. It's still a few years out, but you still try to prepare for those, okay? And, and one of the questions that came up was, uh, what do you predict or what do you see, right, as some of the, the, the challenges 
uh, in preparing for the games? There are so many challenges um, in planning an event of this magnitude in any sector. Um, you know, I think of South by Southwest that I've attended many times. I think about the Grammys or other award shows that happen every year. It, it takes, truly, it takes a village. Um, and there are so many interested parties and partners to help bring it to life. So, you know, as we saw in 2020, a huge challenge of a global pandemic that nobody saw coming um, was a huge challenge. There are things that could happen from a natural perspective that we're preparing for, you know, um, earthquakes, fires, things like that, that are just sort of, unfortunately, um, becoming part of our day-to-day -day lives as California residents, and especially in Southern California. Um, there's so much that we have to prepare for, but the best part of the organization is that we have so many fantastic people, people who have been you know, working within the movement for decades, people who are brand new and bringing fresh ideas to how we can do things differently uh, so that we are truly a different kind of games. So all of that has to go into planning so that, again, we can think about every contingency that we can list out and just know that the unexpected is also bound to happen. Right, and, and, and even to go a little further with that, I, and I think you mentioned this briefly, um, during the, the Tokyo games and, and, and talk about the reflections, uh, we saw many athletes uh, either get on a podium or discuss it in the media during the games about issues such as uh, mental health, right? And we see uh, the rise of several social movements uh, such as Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement. And we know that with those movements, it has changed the landscape in which businesses operate, right? To where businesses have to adjust their core values to meet certain societal needs, okay? And so when, when you're talking about um, athlete demonstrations uh, at the games, is that something that's more focused uh, on the uh, athletics committee that you put together, the athletes commission, I should say, that you put together? Or is it like an overall a holistic uh, viewpoint that you and the committee are taking? You know, it's something that we talk about as an organization. It really is org-wide that we talk about pretty much every day. Um, you know, the USOPC ahead of Tokyo said that they would not sanction uh, Team USA athletes for peaceful demonstrations at the Tokyo Games. And they held very true to that. And we absolutely have been open about our support of that as well. We've also said that we don't believe that anti-racism is at all political. Um, it is about being human and you know, supporting our, our human rights to, to, for freedom. And it's something that I'm personally very passionate about on so many levels, and it's what we stand behind. Uh, you mentioned mental health. That is top of mind for athlete resources and services that we need to provide. It is top of mind within our organization for even our people. You know, we truly do, and we have the benefit of being small right now, um, we're about 100 now, we'll be 6,000 strong by the time the games occur, of, you know, just really taking care of our people first and making sure that the, the mental health of, you know, members of the LA28 organizing committee are being taken care of. And that's something that's absolutely going to carry over into every aspect of our planning with, again, athletes being at the heart of the games. So athletes first and foremost, and ensuring that we're able to provide, you know, similar services and POVs to others throughout the community as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you um, for a really exciting uh, conversation. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately. I want to actually throw this back um, to, to Dr. Pack to, to, to say a few words. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say thank you on behalf of myself and certainly Sean as well, Ashley, for your time tonight and, and for a really informative conversation. Thank you guys, this is great. Okay, great. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'm very sorry that we are not able to get to all the questions and I see uh, lots of lots of questions. I'm sure that we'll have another program on this topic in the future. So thank you again, Ashley, for talking to the community out of your very busy schedule. 
We really appreciate your sharing with us different perspectives and some key aspects of LA 28 games. Your presentation was very informative and insightful. I also like to thank Chris and Sean for moderating intriguing conversation with Ashley. Before we wrap up the webinar, maybe I'd like to use my prerogative as an organizer of this webinar to ask one question to Ashley. I teach international business and management courses at LMU. How do you expect hosting 28 games will influence the business of companies in LA, particularly those engaged in international trade and investment? It's a great question. We are creating a new model for our commercial partnerships that is evidenced in an announcement that we made earlier this summer for our hospitality planning. Um, we have the first ever global hospitality program created in partnership with um, Endeavors on Location and the, all the organizing committees uh, between Paris and LA28 to really create a brand new model of how hospitality can be done and service games to create a, um, an efficient and, you know, unique and distinct experience for all of the games and, and large scale events. So we really hope to be able to create a commercial model that can serve the Olympic and Paralympic movement, but you know, really large scale events in general um, by, by doing it differently and incorporating our partners to be part of our actual games delivery. So hopefully that will become more evident as uh, the years progress. Okay, great. Um, finally, I would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in November. Please stay safe and healthy until then. When you leave this webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey. So I would really appreciate it if you can complete it. So once again, thank you so much, everyone, and good night.